Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, uh, hi everybody. This is something completely different. <laughs> and uh, not very much uh, computer science related, although uh, this popped up on Hacker News so, and generated some discussions. So um, the paper is about uh, analysis of functional MRI data. And uh, I guess on Hacker News, people started talking, is it a software bug or is it a, some other kinds of bugs? So uh, the reason why I want to talk about this, this is uh, I used to work in this field uh, from 97 till 2010. And I kind of stopped paying attention to this. But when it pops up on Hacker News and people start talking interesting things, I try to have a look at this. So that was the Hacker News. This was uh, early, early, uh, early July. Yeah. So then I went to read the, 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 so this was actually not the paper. This was just the, the article on the register. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't take the screenshot of the original one. But when I was so upset, so Facebook helped me to save the original title, which says MRI software bug scoop append years of research. And uh, this article was this, the best example of like how not to do or publish <laughs> anything about like science generalization it was really really good example of super bad journalism <laughs> like just like a, come up with the sensational title copy some uh, things from a paper and say all science basically is broken <laughs> I, I, w I was really upset <laughs> how's that title better uh, well first of all there's MRI and there's F right. MRI yeah. that's a big difference yeah. and then there's software as, a, as, a, as if the whole field of MRI has a single piece of software <laughs> to do everything <laughs> which is no so uh, the funny thing is that this <laughs> this happened this weekend <laughs> about the same thing about the same paper and the same problem with an image which is absolutely nothing to do with the topic and it's just another example of even worse article about it's like <laughs> <concept> <laughs> the same. Yeah, yeah. You c I, it's actually animated. You can Google this title. It's 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 crazy. So uh, some of the quotes. Basically, the, these are the quotes which were made in the, the register articles. Like the most common use of the packages for functional MRI analysis results in false positive rates of seventy percent. This questions the validity basically of all studies that have been done up to date and uh, fMRI exists for more than 25 years now and the next quote was a bug has been sitting in a package whatever for 15 years it, and it produced bad results okay <laughs> now people people <laughs> in hacking news bad results. yeah 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 that, that's how you do uh, science journalism in, 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 in and people on uh, hacking news of course started talking about yeah yeah but fMRI and philosophy and politics and free will and we're gonna <laughs> solve all of this and of course somebody mentioned salmon study if yeah, not I if <laughs> if if okay if you don't know fMRI at all uh, 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 in 2009 somebody published this paper about a, a dead salmon they put it into a scanner and they scanned it showing some pictures and they found three pixels active <laughs> <laughs> And it so actually won an innovable award in neuroscience. <laughs> but so every time routing slowly. No, well some people or say some people alive. say some people say there is a reincarnating soul into the salmon. <laughs> how, how, how long was it dead? <laughs> Sorry? How long was it dead? It's alive. Uh, I, it's reincarnated. No, no, it's we don't know. They, 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 this, these details were not, not in dead the, enough. But You're totally dead. totally You're irrelevant dead. for this study. <laughs> Um, and then people started saying this doesn't sound like a s bug it's actually a statistical problem and then, no 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 it cannot be statistical it must be it's implemented in all common software packages therefore it's a software pro problem <laughs> so clearly people are like uh, so fMRI again is, exists for 25 years and it's uh, it's uh, like a black or white magic. It's either work and everybody is happy, or it doesn't work and everybody is happy again because you can bash it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm gonna bear with me. I'm gonna do five minutes into to <laughs> fMRI, <laughs> fMRI 101. So without bashing, without bashing. So uh, 
we're using uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, it's a, again, technology which in medical field exists uh, since uh, uh, mid 70s. In physics and chemistry, it exists since, uh, since uh, late 40s. Uh, for human applications, this is the device. Uh, we use a very strong uh, uh, magnetic field. So you need a, a it's a V application of superconductivity, the most industry-wise, if you want. Uh, so inside the magnet, so the patient or subject goes inside. It's quite, it's quite large. Uh, inside the magnet, we also have uh, three types of uh, coils which can change the, the, uh, the, the intensity of the field on, on three directions. And that allows us to detect spatial uh, detection of the signal. And the signal is generated by what is known nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon, where you can send a, a RF wave of specific frequency that hits a proton, which is in the magnetic field. It can destabilize it, and when it comes back, it will basically does uh, electrical induction. That's what we measure. And because it's dependent on the field, and the field is varied in space, we know which frequency, so which point in space it's coming from. Uh, some people talk about fMRI scanners. There is no such thing. Uh, we use a regular uh, uh, MRI machines. The only difference is that you need to add uh, what we call a, a stimulation device uh, and a response device. So functional MRI means we actually want to study the, the function of the brain. So we need to, I don't know, either do a visual stimulation or auditory stimulation or uh, maybe tactile stimulation. So this is different kind of stimulation devices which are put inside the scanner so and during stimulation we, we use regular uh, MRI sequences. Uh, the really cool thing about MR is that uh, we are imaging soft tissues. We're basically imaging water or fat like protons uh, and no other techniques allow this and, and we have uh, tons of different ways of creating different contrasts because it's not a single parameter like x-rays, which is only density. Here we, we rely on proton density and uh, some magnetic properties like relaxation times, how quickly things uh, uh, change in, in time when you excite them. So that allows, like, there are hundreds of types of contrasts you can generate in MR. And then there are also, you're not limited in uh, how you make an image in space. You can make your slice in any orientation. Um, you can do any uh, body part. Uh, you can also image things like vessels because like you can differentiate between static tissue or moving blood So that that's a t type of contrast we can we can use and uh, if, if, if you are fast enough you can do what we call dynamic imaging and then you can image things like a uh, heart motion So it's a uh, in a uh, in a uh, it's in in daily clinical routine. This is used uh, I don't know millions of scans per day. It's totally non-invasive it's done more to medicine than what X-ray did to medicine in terms of utility. Uh, then we can, so this is anatomy, like day, day, day routine work. And then we can also do physiology. So these are example only in, in the brain. Uh, we can also do physiology studies in the body. But in the brain, there are basically three main types. It's like functional MRI, perfusion MRI, and diffusion MRI, where functional means brain function, localization of some activity. Perfusion means uh, uh, bl uh, local blood delivery into, into tissue, uh, very useful in strokes and tumor stuff. And diffusion is uh, measuring uh, uh, relative, uh, relative diffusion of water molecules inside white matter. So that allows you to do connectivity between uh, like where the f uh, white matter fibers are, are, are going. So it's quite useful again in uh, like pre-surgical plannings and things like this. So uh, at what conceptual level is this? Um does this categorization exist? Is this like, like how the procedure is done? How it's different types of uh, imaging and different types of... So to, to acquire an image, we have to send uh, what we call a, a pulse sequence, pulses of gradients and RF pulses. And uh, each of them will use completely different sequence. Uh, some parts may be the same. But the big difference I wanted to show you, the anatomy is what is coming out from the scanner uh, like because it's built in. Uh, this stuff is usually you take lots and lots and lots of data and you do a lot of post-processing and this result is later overlaid on anatomy to uh, as, a, as a representation of what you're trying to, to observe. So uh, this paper we're going to discuss is only about functional MRI which is 
uh, this one. So we want to look at uh, uh, if, if, so this is an example of what we call a visual activation. So a person in a scanner sees a black screen versus a, let's say, a colorful screen, which, uh, which basically like uh, does a stroboscope lighting to you. So that, that makes a huge activation in the back of your head. Uh, so so when you say that activation is visualized this way, uh, what does that mean? Because if it's water and fatty tissue that... Yeah, I'm coming to this. Yeah, Activation just to mean that uh, uh, we see an increase in activity in anat anatomically correct uh, right, but how, what, what, how location. Right, but see activity? Yeah, I... I, I next, next slide. Right. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so... Um, uh, fMRI works uh, using this uh, effect. Uh, it's not a so basically when uh, when a neuron starts to fire, uh, their metabolic demand is increasing. So they actually need to start. Uh, there is a signal to say, "Give me more oxygen." So you will have an, a local extraction of oxygen from from blood vessels, which will increase. But at the same time, the the brain will compensate by the mechanism called uh, vasodilation. So you will start flooding the, the, the local area with more uh, uh, blood. And uh, what happens is, um, uh, so blood, if, if you, if, so the oxygen is, uh, is carried by hemoglobin molecule, and if hemoglobin carries uh, oxygen, like it's called oxyhemoglobin, and once it's extracted the oxygen, it becomes deoxyhemoglobin. And magnetic properties of these two hemoglobins change. Because we are in a magnetic environment, this is what we are measuring. It's a localized increase in blood flow due to increased neuronal activity leads to a change in magnetic, local magnetic properties. And that's what we want to measure. But it's a very small change. Uh, depending on the main field strength of the scanner, uh, between, so normally now all of this is used, we're using three Tesla scanners. Uh, again, signal change is around 5%. Uh, this is just to show you that there are a lot of vessels in the in the brain. There's like the the, the brain has more stuff than, than than neurons, but it's the the, the brain the, the 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 vessels at a very small level they are very special. That uh, at a very small level they are very dynamic. They can change locally. Uh, the the it's especially on the arterial side. They can uh, immediately not immediately. Uh, I will show later. Uh, <coughs> within, within a few seconds, they will respond to local demand in a, in a increased sustained neuronal activity. That's what we're going to measure. So, how do we do this in uh, imaging? So, we need a very fast uh, um, imaging technique. So, the one which is commonly used is called echoplanar imaging, uh, EPI, and uh, normally we do a multi-slice imaging, not not complete 3D imaging because 3D is slower. So multi-slice is faster. And uh, normally we do about 10 to 15 slices. Each slice is five millimeters with in-plane resolution of 64 to one to eight pixels only for a 25 cm field of view. So you are roughly two to four millimeters in space. So if you think of this as a 3D pixel, which is called a voxel, right? This is pretty big voxels. There's actually millions of neurons inside of a single single voxel uh, each slice takes about 50 to 100 millisecond acquisition time so a, a, a brain volume takes about 1 to 1 1.5 seconds to acquire and then what we do is we're going to acquire 100 to 200 of those volumes in time every 2 to 3 seconds and while we are doing this the person will experience some kind of uh, uh, activation paradigm like either you don't do you, you are in one condition and then you change the condition and then we will see how how this change and for the for the analysis uh, normally there are some pre-processing steps uh, like maybe the patient is moving in a scanner so you need to correct because otherwise in time you don't know where you are uh, there is some slice timing correction because 50 milliseconds for slice it differs for different types of the brain uh, normally people apply some spatial smoothing. Normally it's Gaussian in 3D. Uh, and then the actual analysis, which is the subject of the paper, is the statistical analysis. So you have, a, you have this uh, 3D collection of voxels and you want to look in time uh, how the signal intensity changed 
depending on the paradigm that was used. So you're trying to look at the at, at a signal change which is similar to the paradigm. And later you somehow, so you have this statistical map in the end, in, in general, and you want to uh, say that this is an active area versus this is a non-active area. This is what the activation means in this, in this context. And uh, you can either project it on a different anatomy or you can do some fancy 3D reconstructions, but that's irrelevant in a, usually you don't, you don't really need this. There are, so in the statistical analysis, people have tried more or less everything. We know w what's known in statistics to see who, <laughs> who will find a better way. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know 90% of it, <laughs> it's too much. Uh, just to mention something, um, what we, again, we're not, fMRI does not measure neuronal activity directly. We me it's a metabolic imaging technique. So we are measuring a vascular response to neuronal activation. And well, we actually know that it happens between two to four seconds after the onset of neuronal activation. So these are things that needs to be taken into account. Either you model them or you try to measure them, which is not easy. But if you, if you do have model of what we call a hemodynamic response functions, you can overlay and, co and uh, convolve your, your, your paradigm and then use it as a model to, to, to look for your activation areas. Any questions? Um, so the perfusion versus fMRI. So fMRI is sort of a um, subset of perfusion because you're measuring blood flow of sorts in both of them? Or yeah, so it's a... you just have a simulation. So perfusion uh, in an in a MR context, you really are measuring only the uh, what's called um, cerebral blood flow uh, in a whole of the brain, and independent of any task. Okay. And here it's and here it's a change in it's change in perfusion slash oxygen extraction. Okay, because you can tell the difference between yeah. uh, oxygen and the oxygen. In in people who do quantitative fMRI, they will they will separate all this into cerebral blood flow maps, uh, oxygen extraction fractions, uh, cerebral blood volume. Those are the three main parameters. And for cer what what people use clinically for perfusion is just to know that uh, the the rate of delivery of blood into the tissue is okay, versus oh this person had a stroke, therefore there is no there is no or insufficient perfusion of tissue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, paper. <laughs> so uh, so this is roughly what you need to know. I did well. Of course, there are tons of details of how people do statistics, and uh, actually, the, a lot of stuff goes into pre-processing stuff. Uh, how do you motion correct? How do you normalize the data? There's actually lots of unsolved issues there. So what this paper did is uh, uh, they have taken, uh, uh, well, first thing first, the actual quote in the register does come from the paper and it's really bad and this, they got really like criticized for this and they've already submitted a, 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 a like a, a correction to say, I'm, I'm very sorry, <laughs> we didn't mean that. <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately, so this, but Again, the big problem in the register paper is that it's a it's a it's a quote taken out of context of something which is much more narrow. That's the biggest problem in the in the this register article. So, what have they done? Um, uh, just one thing: uh, people are now doing uh, something called resting state fMRI, where you put a subject into the scanner and you scan him like for regular fMRI scan, but there is no actual activation going on. And people have tried to use it to basically take a per portion of a brain and see which other areas of the brain respond just like this. So it's like natural uh, models of, of what you're looking in the brain. And using this, you try to find what we call connectivity between brain regions. Maybe your uh, like a motor function is correlated to some prefrontal cortex in a maybe delay, time delayed, but otherwise it's a similar pattern. So it's a kind of connectivity measure, potentially. But resting fMRI has no activation. So what they've done is uh, 500 subjects, uh, they took resting state fMRI, and then they do uh, four fake simulations. Like they assume that this pa patient 
was looking at uh, four different uh, patterns of uh, activation. And, uh, and then they tried a few uh, variation of uh, parameters like smoothing or types of statistical tests they're gonna run. And uh, something about either you do voxel by voxel or you do a cluster. So the whole thing about cluster F is about this cluster. So this is the result, uh, one of the main results showing that uh, if you do, uh, yeah, forget about titles, that, but basically if you do a uh, cluster defined threshold at p value 0, 0, 001, uh, we, yeah, and they say because we know it's a null data, there is no activation possible, we're going to set our p values at 1%, 5%, signif we, we are expecting to see 5%. Uh, false positives. We expect them. And this is what they show. This is our expected error bars. And we are, s we are seeing anything between 20 to 40 uh, percent instead of, instead of 5. So that was like something is going wrong. But if you change the cluster uh, cluster defined threshold, you go 10 times more restrictive, it goes down. So, but there are still examples of twenty percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's that's not fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, this is uh, nowhere near seventy percent of all of MRI studies. <laughs> 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 well, but uh, no, no, no. Because yeah. after you uncover something like this, the reasonable thing to do would be to just take all the raw data from previously published. Come in, come in, come in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they've tested they've tested uh, uh, all the standard uh, uh, statistical toolbox which are available and people are using uh, as a, as a standard tool. And so this is the result which is producing seventy percent is coming from this figure, where they do a. Uh, this is the most common way of analyzing uh, uh, data without using a. Uh, cluster defined thresholds which basically means people do a very simple statistics and then they say they get a noisy image out of it they maybe this threshold let's say at a uh, i know p value j at the at the voxel level this threshold at the vo at the val i don't know five percent alpha zero zero five and then they say i want five voxels together and the rest i discard it's a it's a uh, non uh, how to say they don't really calculate what is the probability of having activation cluster there is no statistics involved if you do this you get your 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 false positive rate up to 70% or even higher so that's where 70% is coming from so of <laughs> so what this paper is actually talking about is Actually, it only applies to, uh, you can do fMRI on a single subject, which is actually amazing, because you can take a guy, put him into a scanner, finger tap, and you know exactly where it's happening, or do a language task, or do a visual task, and it's an anatomically sound, we know it works. Uh, it starts breaking down where you start doing some free will and uh, political orientation stuff, and people are trying to do this put the people in a scan and show him Trump and Hillary <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we will get a Nobel Prize in peace <laughs> for this study. <laughs> I really hope it, it happens. <laughs> yeah, but no, uh, a lot of, you can do a lot of good fMRI work uh, if you know what you're doing. Uh, you just need to, you just need to be sure you have a statistician on board as well as a physicist who knows a little bit about your noise distribution. The, ba the biggest problem in the paper is uh, when you do when you do smoothing uh, at a, as a as a as a pre-processing step, uh, most people just apply Gaussian smoothing so they can run uh, regular random uh, field theory, uh, regular Gaussian statistics. Like you just I smooth my 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 my, my spatial error should be Gaussians, so you smooth them. Of course you have them, but actually it's a, it turns out it's not a uh, 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 the spatial autocorrelation function is 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 much heavier than, than, than it was expected before. The noise, spatial noise is not, is not Gaussian. And that's the main reason why the cluster statistics are not working as they, as they expected to work. That's the main uh, 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 message from this, uh, from this paper. 
but again, only if you do this kind of cluster-based uh, statistical analysis to define clusters of activations. Uh, regarding the software bug, the software bug existed in a single package on a, like a, <laughs> nobody actually, I would say 99% of users, like, don't ever use this. <laughs> no, not software. No, no, but you tell that most of the packages assume a Gaussian distribution. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but and the it was a wrong assumption. So it was for all the packages. Assumption. Yeah, but it's 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 not it's not a software problem. It's a it's a statistical yeah. problem. Uh, there was a real uh, software bug that was discovered, but it was so minor that it's insignificant for at least for the ha hacker news crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it's in a it's in a very uh, small part of it. Uh, yeah, the, the the big problem with uh, with functional MRI is that people try to be creative with what they try to measure with this tool. So currently, we we, we really we ba we barely know how it works on a physiology level. We barely know how to apply it at a very like rough uh, like, uh, like motor skill or visual skill or this kind of things. It's very useful clinically. It's not useful in political science. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's like a wider problem. So I, every few years, yeah, I see a crop of papers that say that in this domain we have a lot of false positives, and now it is normal because most of our our scientific results now are effect of software processing and heavy statistical processing. Yeah. I understand that MRI starts with some kind of re recording radio signal after after the impulse comes. So you you need to go quite a lot of steps before you get any 3D image. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, 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 absolutely. But again, and, and this every, is every every one of these steps may be broken because yes. somebody made a wrong statistical assumption. That's why. So. There, there is a very good blog post about this in a discovery magazine by a guy called Neuroseptic. He did a very nice summary of what went wrong, what, what didn't wrong. And the good thing is a lot of scientists went to uh, uh, comment on this, like what's the actual issues about the n uh, noise characteristics, which we don't know where, where work should be done. So this is a very nice uh, blog post if you want to do. The big lesson is actually somebody in, uh, in uh, how can you say the takeaway lessons of this research is that the open data sh is of vital importance. In, 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 in medical research, data sharing is almost non-existent. I cannot go and say, hey, I like your project, give me your data, I want to reanalyze this. It just doesn't happen. It's almost, it's, so it's just, it's just started recently, people started creating uh, 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 repositories of, 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 of data sets so this, this paper was only possible because of this uh, Open Connect Tom uh, uh, project, which made data available for free to anybody. So, so you, these 500 the subjects were possible to, to do this study. So does that mean that they couldn't do the obvious thing, which is to Previous run on raw data from all the references? Previously. But that's not science. I mean, that's just, <laughs> just people who are publishing but because that's what they need behind. to do to get their salary from their university, mm -hmm. but they're not Right. That's how much stuff is in. You you would be yeah. It's it's actually some. Yeah, but it's important to be out there. Yes, the it's 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 good. It's good that more people realize that this is not happening. So you can go and hey, I'm paying my money for exactly. do research. This actually happens not because of researchers, but um, actually this is normally blocked at uh, university levels because people there are either no policies or people freak out or this is maybe patient data mm -hmm. or. There are a lot of uh, barriers for 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 um, uh, data distribution in a, in a, in a, in an easy way. Only only very few subjects uh, uh, make available data easily for for non scientists, or even even within the scientific community. Like just because I I work in this field in this university doesn't mean I can easily go and request data from another place. It just doesn't doesn't exist. It's, it happen it's just happening to data sets which are available because I used to be in UK and I remember uh, asking for a huge amount of data from a website and I, they actually gave me, there were like uh, maybe, uh, maybe 12 studies and I asked for the CD and they basically sent me the CD for free. So I was using SP SPM5 at the time. Yep. Uh, but, but, and over time, uh, a yep. lot of studies dealing with, uh, hmm. I think, epilepsy or TC. Yep. So like there's more and more, I mean, 
it exists. It, so it either exists because of an existing agreement or a collaboration study, because uh, it's really hard to scan uh, hundreds of people in one site. So you normally distribute it across site with an agreement that people will have access to all the data. This may be one possibility. So now more and more people start sharing data because they more and more people say, we actually want others to, to replicate my results. Otherwise, uh, we are not sure. It, it gives an extra weight to the, to the study because everybody now is like, no, 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 no. We don't want to share the data or even less the uh, analysis methods. But it's it's slowly slowly coming. In big centers can <laughs> afford to probably have you know, some 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 place like uh, from uh, Oxford or whatever they, they provide okay. some some data. But work in the US, of course. The, 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 the another huge problem is again uh, scientists have no idea how to store and distribute this yeah, data yeah, yeah. because most of this data is currently on USB drives in somebody's in somebody's table. But let's not call them scientists because basically what they're saying what do you is mean? that they are not really interested in finding <laughs> they, they, are not, they are not they are not computer don't, scientists. Their no, 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 no. <laughs> aim is not that. to to find out about how do you the share terabytes because yeah, unless you do you do, you do. Yeah, you unless do. you want that it's it, obvious that you want to share your data so that others can can discover that your results yeah, are wrong. You don't want to be right. This is this is platonic ideal. <laughs> which, 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 which really doesn't exist in, <laughs> in reality, unfortunately. University level friction is very common as well. Like even if the researchers themselves don't care. I mean, I mean, even before talking data sharing, uh, access to journals is still a huge problem. Yes. Yep. Like well, open, open access movement started. This it is. It is. You, you as, as, as a scientist, you can publish your, but, but, yeah, but it's not happening because there is strange uh, agreements between uh, universities and universities and publishers and stuff like this. But again, it's not in, in the hands of scientists directly. I'm sorry, it sounds like, um, it, it sounds like what you're saying this is that this is mostly a social slash political slash cultural issue. Yes. Isn't this also, isn't there also a feasibility problem here? Because my understanding is that, um, particularly if you're talking about this kind of medical data, there's enormous volumes of it, right? So, but but, but you, YouTube has solved it long yeah. time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there, there and, is and, 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 and CERN is producing like 10 times more than YouTube. Right, but so we know technology, it's not a big technology problem. But it's expensive, so... Uh, yeah, it's no, but again, the example that you're giving is one where there's um, a particular group of people working on this, not... I don't know, I, I mean, are they sharing all of their data? Or there currently, okay, in, in, in MR field, I would say maybe, uh, like, maybe 2% people share data. So they're able to share... Yeah, 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 so the, the, there are a few projects either specifically, like Open Connect Home projects, or uh, ADNI project, which is the Alzheimer dataset project. Yeah, this, yeah, this one, this one, and also this one is uh, China. Be I mean, Beijing is yeah. Beijing. There's also dataset from. Yep, yep, yep. So there are there are groups that share for specific projects, but it's not like I published a paper. Uh, here's a GitHub for my data. <laughs> that doesn't e that doesn't exist. Someday. 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 Is that people awesome. will probably not be able to replicate most of the time. This but we won't know until we try. Another question is, um, I mean, we, we are we are we are open to data, but what about the other people who are very overly concerned about privacy and the scared that uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, it's all the the, the the anonymization part is again a solved problem. I know, but we 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 can solve this problem how, without how problem. Of, when you go for a survey, how many people? actually choose to opt out for, you know, for it, 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 it could also be a, uh, okay. It's a social, it's a social. It, it's a social, but you can, again, you can, you can, you can, it could be an exclusion or exclusion criteria for people to participate. Okay, you introduce a bias of somebody not, uh, wa not willing to, to share <laughs> his. So basically, before you get uh, scanned, normally you, people will give you a tick box. Yeah. Do you want this yeah. data so, to so be the problem is. If seventy percent of people take no, and 
Yeah, yeah, but you don't you don't scan them or you it's not a probably more than the 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 there is an issue with privacy, but this is a known problem and we know how to deal with it uh, in terms of anonymization. It's not a big big problem. So you said anonymization is a solved problem. I'm quite curious about that. Sorry? You said anonymization is a solved problem. I'm kind of curious about that because my understanding is that de-anonymization is a significant research de anonymization So de-anonymization on something the level of uh, location data is it's very simple because you can independently get a second set of this data. Now, if I was able to scan your brain, I could easily find your brain. Okay, maybe not easy, but I could potentially find your brain amongst a data set of brains. But I can't scan your brain without. But you but, know what I mean? but access to your brain data is harder. So, so sure. But what I'm saying is that it sounds like um, this explanation is very specific um, in the sense that it's not. Um, it's not a generalized explanation as to why this. Okay, can I, I, I can answer yeah. so. When, whenever somebody goes into a scanner inside the medical facility, you have all the details like the name, maybe the ID, the, the age and uh, things like this. And when it, this data comes out of a scanner, there's a huge chunk of metadata, right? We, we know how to cut this chunk off. And that means you just have a raw data, which is just a collection of pixels of your brain. It's virtually impossible to identify a person based on his axial scans of his brain. Right? <laughs> There's no, it's it's not like a fingerprint, right? I mean, I, I would have guessed that the things like, even things like noise would act as fingerprints of where a scan was done. No. Like, again, you can only fingerprint it if you can get that noise in another yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 but, uh, but I, I'm saying um, at the very least, you could do things like, um, you know, I'm getting, again, this is completely hypothetical, of course, but um, uh, if I have a whole bunch of uh, such scans, then I can sort of do some sort of component analysis and, um, Sure, you, you can find, like but you, you can find different people. Like you can like say, history. guess what? This guy had a brain scan twice. That's all you're gonna get. With no point analysis. And, 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 and even then, it's like not a, not ob not obvious. Brand of MR machine. So yeah. it's not obvious that it's the, the same. That's kind of the same guy. Sorry. It's not obvious to find that this is the scan. If, if if I if I have a multi slice with slightly different angulation, and if I don't know how to reorient it yeah. to brain, if I don't have enough data, I won't be able to say. I mean, 50% uh, of the time. Well, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know, because usually you take the whole volume of the whole uh, study, and you can actually uh, do some IC, etc., and maybe study the noise of uh, that particular scanner. Yeah, but, but yeah you can, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to identify the brand of the so, scanner, I imagine. So, than so there are things like, if, if I, uh, there are more problems with things like, uh, let's say, blood samples. And, uh, and genetic analysis, because these things can reappear in completely different unrelated studies, and you can maybe trace. But in uh, in so if you start doing this, and then you combine, uh, let's say, anatomy images, and then you link those together. So as soon as you add uh, more and more information, at the end, maybe at some point you will be able to uh, click to have an identity associated with this. Uh, biomedical data. But, but, but isn't that really an issue only with what we have already termed as the junk part of it? Because you know, if you do a study on my brain activation, if I see some flashing light, what if you can identify me with fucking D beer, right? Just with your <laughs> fMRI? <laughs> rest, rest assured, no. <laughs> for, for, for a long time. With the political stuff, no. I can see how you know, this is different. Okay, this is your brain activation on Pe porn, various porn images. Yes, I can see. People, ha people have tried to use fMRI as a lie detector device, failed miserably. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. But then the privacy issue, like, why doesn't even come up? Well, no, no, no. I'm not saying there is no. My brain is the one which lights up. In this particular way, if you show me yeah. a flashing checker for it, I mean, it's well. That's so so there, there is an issue yeah, with privacy, yeah, but I, we mostly know how to deal with it yeah. in a in a sensible way. In a within a scientific context, we can do we can deal with it relatively well. If that's the question. If we want to advance the science, we need people to to participate and be willing to share data, and we just need to reassure them <laughs> that their direct personal information will never be shared. So. You can give fake names or fake name IDs, or you can randomize some things like this. But directly from the data, it's almost impossible to identify a person. So, who would be in position to push more sharing of data? 
Uh, mostly, actually, uh, high high level university administrators. So that would be a good target. And the publishers will also impose that. Uh, all well, publishers are becoming irrelevant because people go uh, open access way already. And yeah, there, there, are, there are, there are, there are. Journals would would say because there are, there is precedent in some domains that every study, in particular, in particular domain, has to deposit data. Yes. There. So th there are fields where they start requiring da uh, raw data, but they also provide the service. Some publishers already provide, let's say, in a, uh, in, in some bioinformatics, like 3D models of, uh, of proteins, you can already upload uh, known formats, and it has to be there because in your, in your paper you have to provide the link to this data set. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a minority of, uh, of, of fields where this exists. So astronomy is doing well in data sharing because astronomy is similar field in terms of data size. Uh, particle physics are doing well; they are sharing most of the data. Um, but that's all I can. Uh, some 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 some, bio, some biochemistry is happening, but that's it. They also have a problem with data volume, so they sometimes cannot give you all the raw data, say, because of the data volume. Yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. There, there's also a problem like you can't just, okay, I want all the CERN data, all right. <laughs> Give me 100 petabytes high drive <laughs> and maybe I'll get 10% of the data. Well, that's it, I mean, it's a couple of terabytes, it's not much. Yeah, but, but a couple of terabytes today is a couple of petabytes tomorrow, right? Don't download, you know, petabytes over internet. Unmanageable query. For most researchers, it's really hard to manage data because people are just used to manage Excel files, and even then they are having troubles. Uh, you have a postdoc; he lives after four years. And who <laughs> takes care of the data? Re 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 redo the <laughs> redo the study. Yeah. No, no, really, like. Or you have a research group that existed for eight years. So, very quickly, is the the gist of the paper? Is the reason of for the false positive basically that they were doing statistical fishing, or was it the main? So, the main the main reason with the in uh, our assumptions of spatial autocorrelation, the noise of the uh, of the exists spatial noise that exists in the, in our data. Uh, our Gaussian model is definitely incorrect, and uh, and uh, few people are uh, making uh, how to say trying to solve this problem. So most people just want to run a study, run it through a uh, black box analysis, get nice activation images, and uh, make some claims about uh, cognitive science. Which was but, but all the results which were based on this Gaussian smoothie, those ones we can safely just throw out and start from scratch, right? No, because you need to know uh, what kind of uh, thresholds they were using and uh, what kind of actual pre-processing steps were done. So, so in the in the when they published a uh, um, like uh, additional information for their paper, so of course they said this is not affecting all the studies. The current estimates it affects like 3,000 studies because this is 3,000 uh, that we're using this kind of uh, uh, analysis techniques. But still, the the the, the big problem is actually uh, the assumptions of uh, of noise in uh, in the data. But again, because now we have more open data, that hopefully more people will start working on this and exposing it more. So the really good thing about the paper it exposes the problem as a that <laughs> we have a problem. You're right. Thank you very much.